everyone, and welcome to another Heart for PCOS interview. Today, we have the honor and privilege of speaking with one of the top authorities on PCOS, Dr. Ricardo Aziz. Dr. Aziz is a world-renowned leader in the field of polycystic ovary syndrome, also known as PCOS, and an internationally recognized clinical transitional scientist who has developed over the past 25 years an important program in androgen excess disorders research. Thank you for having me, Ashley. Absolutely. So I would like to start by talking a little bit about PCOS as far as the serious nature of the condition and the impact it's having on care. Is PCOS a public health issue? PCOS is definitely a public health issue. Uh, our group and others have been looking at this for some time. It, uh, PCOS is the single most common endocrine metabolic uh, disorder of women. It affects uh, one in seven to one in 10 women worldwide. So we have lots of studies now around the world, uh, although there are lots of parts of the world that we still have to, to, to analyze. Um, it's a very important disorder, and it doesn't just affect um, fertility, which it does, or menstrual function, but it also affects uh, our, the, our metabolism, our risk of diabetes, uh, our heart function, our vascular function, and it's really a, an important disorder. So we've been trying to estimate the economic burden of polycystic ovary syndrome. It's one of the ways that we can assess whether a disorder is of significant public uh, health impact. And, and so far, just on the medical costs alone, uh, uh, the cost in the United States uh, for polystic ovary syndrome exceeds $15 billion a year. And that's not taken into account productivity loss, quality of life loss, uh, cancer impact, lots of other things. So it's a significant public health impact, uh, not just because of the cost, but because of the millions of women that are affected. Yeah, and not enough research is really being done on this. So I know that you have done a lot of research. Can you tell us why research is important and what current findings are showing? Well, you know, one of the amazing things about polycystic ovary syndrome is that that it is underfunded, that that research is simply not being supported as well as we'd like it to be for a disorder of this importance, for a disorder that affects so many, so many women in so many ways. Um, it's something that we've talked about. We've, we've discussed it. Uh, we're certainly discussing it with our government officials, with our officials at the National Institutes of Health. Um, but it's important to understand and for the for everybody to understand that the only way we're going to make uh, in rows, and we're going to move forward and on improving the lives of women affected with polycystic ovary syndrome, on trying to find avenues to detect and prevent the disorder before it develops into a full-blown uh, 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 problem. And the way that we can determine new ways of treating this disorder is by research. Uh, and uh, and so we are very passionate about uh, research in this area. But you're right. For example, the entire field of uh, what I call epidemiology and public health of polycystic ovary syndrome is very much unfunded. Very few, you know, very few people, if any institution, actually funds that research. And so it's an important uh, area for uh, government officials, for the public to understand, and obviously for women with PCOS to serve as advocates for. Absolutely. Um, because statistics for PCOS worldwide used to be one in 10 or approximately up to 12%. Um, but now we are starting to see statistics that are pointing to as high as 26% in some countries worldwide or one in five. So why are we seeing such a large jump in the numbers? Does research play into that and, and not having enough awareness play into that? Or is it something in our environment? Well, I think it's a it's a very good question. So so I think first we have to be cautious about comparing numbers to numbers, because clearly, uh, depending on the definition used, depending on the tools that are used to detect polystic ovary syndrome, depending on the quality of the hormonal assays and the ultrasounds and all these kind of things, you know, that will depend also on how many uh, women that are affected will be detected in populations. So I think it's important to understand that I don't know that we have any strong evidence today that the that the uh, that the true 
prevalence of polystegovery syndrome has increased. There are reports noting that the incidence or the reporting in health system has increased over the past few years, but I also can attribute that in part because we have been working very hard to have the medical community begin to recognize polystegovery syndrome. You know, it used to be, and in fact, for many women, it still is the reality that, you know, women with polystegovery syndrome had to go to four, five, six physicians before they ever got a diagnosis and and, and before they found uh, a practitioner that understood the disorder. So so to be fair, it's, it's unclear yet to me, studying this field, whether the incidence or prevalence of polystegovery syndrome has increased in the last 20 years. What we do know is it still affects enormous amount of individuals. Certainly more than 10% of women are affected with polycystic ovary syndrome. And what we also know is that the increasing wave of obesity that is affecting the globe and in, in most countries around the world is making the metabolic, cardiometabolic uh, complications of polystic ovary syndrome worse. Uh, and so we know that that may also be part of the reason that we're beginning to recognize more women as affected with polystic ovary syndrome because they're sicker now, uh, because the, the rate of obesity is making that worse. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about physicians that still need to recognize PCOS. So why do you think after 85 years since this condition was first written about in modern medical literature, are the majority of providers and patients and the public still not understanding PCOS? No, well, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, polystic ovary syndrome is uh, certainly a, a, a not a simple disorder, right? There's not, not one single test that can put it together. But it is not a tremendously complex puzzle otherwise, right? Uh, you know, you do have to understand uh, that you need to evaluate the androgen status of individuals and their ovulatory status and their ovarian morphology and so on. But there are clear steps on how to do that. Uh, so to me, that's one of those mysteries. Or you know, why is polystic ovary syndrome, which has been fairly clearly uh, delineated, so difficult still for the healthcare community to un understand? I can't tell you how often I hear the word, oh, it's complicated. Oh, the definition is unclear and so on. That is not true. That may have been true 40 years ago. It's certainly not true today. So part of the efforts that we have to undertake is educating not just the public, not just government officials, not just granting agencies, but also uh, the medical community. It's no doubt that they require a greater education on polystic ovary syndrome, and all specialties are going to see them, whether they are family physicians or internal medicine or endocrinologists or surgeons uh, or obesity care physician, you know, dermatologists, they're all going to be seeing a fair amount of patients with polystic ovary syndrome. Right. So if we don't start changing this narrative, what are the implications if we continue to dismiss the condition or downplay how it affects cardiometabolic health or increase risk factors for conditions like lipid abnormalities, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, and ultimately cardiovascular disease? Well, you know, in part, what's going to happen is that the patients who are affected, the millions and millions of women who are affected, are certainly not going to get the kind of care that they deserve. Now, I should be clear, you know, women's health, research in women's health has always been underemphasized and underfunded globally and in the United States. So in part, uh, polystic ovary syndrome, uh, under recognition, suffers because it is a, quote, women's disorder, right? And, and that is something we have to recognize. But more importantly, if we don't do something about it, you know, we basically will not be able to improve you know, the health of, of many women. I should also point out that in addition to, to educating all of those people that we said needed to, the government officials and grantors and, and public and, 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 and healthcare providers, we have to also try to educate uh, patients with polystic ovary syndrome. There's many women who don't know that they have it. Uh, there's many women who think that they have it, but don't really know how to get evaluated. There's many of them that don't understand that it is a lifelong disorder, that it affects many more things than just your reproduction or your, or your skin or your hair growth. 
Um, so we, we need to make better efforts at, at educating our patient community. Often when we're talking about cardiovascular disease, which is kind of like my hill to die on and the reason why I've been doing the Heart for PCOS over the past 10 years, um, we're often talking about its connections to just heart health. Um, but we also know that there are other connections to cerebrovascular health. So can you discuss cerebrovascular health, what it is and the potential risks to patients with PCOS? So, you know, when we talk about cardiometabolic health, we we have to understand that it implies a large number of things. You know, uh, metabolic uh, uh, health uh, speaks to how we uh, regulate our proteins and our sugars and all of those kind of things. And so we tend to think of things like metabolic syndrome, diabetes, prediabetes, gestational uh, diabetes, these kind of things. And I think we do know that women with polycystic ovary syndrome have a five to seven fold higher rate of these complications than women of the same age. Now, I think it's important to understand that not all women with polycystic ovary syndrome are going to develop diabetes in these things. Then we have the cardiovascular side of, of the complications. Now, this isn't just heart, it's the blood vessels in our body. And so women uh, with polycystic ovary syndrome also have an increased risk of blood vessel disease, if you would, vascular disease. And we know, for, for, for instance, that the incidence of cerebrovascular accidents, or what we commonly know as strokes, are, are much increased in, in women with polycystic ovary syndrome, again, compared to women of their same age. So again, it's, it's a rare event in general. It's still relatively rare. And of course, we also know that cardiovascularly, heart-wise, you know, women with polycystic ovary syndrome are affected. Now, the problem is to what extent they are affected. Uh, do they die more often from heart disease? These kind of things. We still don't know, but we do know that a lot of markers for heart disease are increased in women with polycystic ovary syndrome. So important. And do you feel with that, that perceptions are finally starting to change with regards to PCOS? And what do we do as patients to propel this forward and continue to demand more awareness and better care? Well, I, I do think there is an increasing recognition that polystic ovary syndrome is a cardiometabolic uh, reproductive disorder. I mean, it affects all of the systems in uh, a woman's body. And of course, it impacts quality of life significantly. Um, there is some increasing recognition, but certainly not enough. You know, I've been in the field for 40 years and uh, some people may call me inpatient, but I think 40 years is a long time. Uh, so, so the reality is we need to accelerate that knowledge. And part of that acceleration isn't going to come just from the scientists like myself that are doing research in this or from the healthcare community. It's going to have to come from the patients themselves, from the patient community that needs to drive and educate uh, both the patients themselves, the public in general, the government officials, and the healthcare providers. So, so I think it's going to be a two-way street, uh, and we have a lot of work to be done if patients with polystic ovary syndrome are actually going to be able to receive the kind of care and dedication they deserve. Absolutely. Um, so vital that patients get involved, they raise their voices, they support research, they support organizations like PCOS Challenge, um, because that's how we effectuate change. So if people want to learn more about the work that you are doing, how can they find you through either social media, websites, or organizations that you work with? Well, that's a, that's a kind thing to do. It's, it's not hard to find me on the web. Uh, you know, there is, uh, you can go to www.ricardoaziz.com. Uh, uh, that's a way to do that. You can go to the University of Alabama uh, Birmingham website and find me there uh, uh, under uh, research uh, faculty. Um, unfortunately, I'm actually not hard to find on the web, but thank you for that. And, and thank you for what you do. I really appreciate it because it's important that we continue to emphasize and educate everybody involved about the importance of cardiometabolic disorders in polystig ovary syndrome. Couldn't agree with you more. And I thank you for taking the time to sit down and speak with me this afternoon and share your knowledge and expertise. You have always had patients and patient care at the forefront of all that you do. Your voice and your work are invaluable. And I thank you not only for what you've done, but 
with the love that you have done it for this community. So thank you, Dr. Aziz, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, thank you for joining in another interview. Please make sure to check our social media channels at Heart for PCOS, our Facebook pages, and our blog posts. We have lots of content, lots of activities, and lots of events that you can get involved in throughout the month of February. Have a great day.